Yay. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the slightly late start. Um, so hopefully everyone is here for the uh, Java Enterprise Edition panel uh, to try and figure out what the heck is going on with it right now and where it's going to go in the future and why is it still important? Is it still important? Uh, all these questions and more will hopefully be answered. Uh, so we've got a bunch of panelists here who are all uh, leading luminaries in the Java Enterprise Edition space. Um, and I'm quickly going to go through seven very quick slides, sort of introduce the panel, give a bit of context as to why this has become a topic. You know, Java EE has been around for a very long time, so why is there all this buzz around it again uh, happening at the moment? And uh, then we'll leave it up to you, the audience, and the audience on Twitter to ask questions and hopefully get honest answers, although we do have the frog of immunity. So unfortunately, some questions uh, may require people to uh, not be allowed to answer due to legal matters. In that case, they will utilize their frog of immunity uh, given to us by Antonio, who is from France. Make of that what you will. And uh, we, we will go from there. So uh, without further ado, if you want to ask a question and you are too shy to do it in person, then tweet to hash UKEE and we will monitor this and we will ask the questions on your behalf. If you wish to ask a question in person, then you can meet Roo down here and he will hand you a microphone and you can ask your question. So think of some questions. So the panel is uh, kind of me. Hi, I'm Martin. I help run the London Java community. And I'll actually let the panelists now introduce themselves, starting all the way from the end, Ian. Hi there. Uh, I'm Ian Robinson. I'm from IBM. Um, I've been working with Java since the late 90s, and I'm uh, guilty for WebSphere. <laughs> Boo. I mean, yay. Uh, David Blevins uh, with Tommy Tribe, and I've been working in the EE space since about 1999. Uh, in the open source and uh, was on EE6, EE7, and what is currently uh, being called EE8. Uh, and uh, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Little. I'm a CTO of JBoss, work for Red Hat, run the middleware and uh, mobile groups. Uh, I've been working with uh, Java since it was called Oak. Anybody remember that? Uh, and Java E since it was called J2E. So what was that, 97, 98? All right, I'm Heather Van Cura, and I work in the Java community process. I'm director of the program office, and I've worked with the Java community since 2000. Hi, I'm An Antonio, um, community, Pirate Java user group, DevOps France. But I've also been involved in the Java E space for a long, long time because I used to be a BA systems employee. So. I used to do WebLogic 2 and WebLogic 3. And since then, I've been involved in the Java EE6 expert group, EE7, and the so-called EE8 expert group. Hi, my name is Peter Pilgrim. Uh, some of you in London might recognize me, former uh, founder of a user group here. Been working with Java since 98, EE, I guess 2000, or when it was called J2EE. -E. I've written a few books, and I still consult and contract around the Java EE -E space. And it appears that the oh, 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 sorry. Oh. And there's Oracle here uh, <laughs> missing. Sorry. So Oracle could not supply a representative today, uh, except for perhaps the rain. So uh, this is going to let me go through. Hello. Uh, sorry about this. Here we go. So, uh, so for people who don't know, we actually have a Java standards body which govern, governs both Java SE, Java EE, and Java ME. So when Java 8 comes out, Java 9 comes out, Java EE 6, 7, and 8, these are all actually standards. And there's a standards body called the Java Community Process, uh, who Heather works for, uh, who goes through and, and ratifies these standards. And a bunch of vendors, community people, and uh, I guess customers or end users of EE, et cetera, uh, actually help, help run these. So here's a brief history of what's happened with Java EE uh, in the past few years. And uh, as you can see, Java EE 7 was made up of uh, over 30 different uh, standards. So 
your servlet, your JPA, your CDI, JAXRS, all those popular ones, EJB, boo, um, the not so popular ones, so on and so forth. For Java EE7, here are a, a list, uh, I believe an almost complete list of, of who the certified uh, application servers are in this space. Um, you'll see very familiar names there, uh, including a couple of people who are representing us on the panel today. Uh, notice that WebSphere is now WebSphere Liberty. It's no longer the evil heavyweight WebSphere of old, we promise. And here are some of the things that we were hoping, or the community at large and vendors and, and end users were hoping would come into Java EE8. So uh, JSON binding, which is a little bit overdue in the Java space as, as a standard, considering every other language has had it for ooh, about 10 years. Um, getting in caching as a standard would be fantastic. Do people here use things like Coherence, Hazelcast, EHCache? any of that sort of stuff, right? So to be able, able to actually have a, a decent common API so you can swap implementations, et cetera, would, would be nice. And of course, uh, the world of asynchronous and uh, WebSockets is, is now here. It has been for quite some time. And so it's things like the Servlet 4 and HTTP 2 specification being implemented as a standard in Java is something that we've been waiting for for, for quite some time. Unfortunately, Java EE8 has kind of ground to a halt in terms of work. So pretty much nothing has been done on it uh, for about nine months, uh, except for one or two individual specifications which are being led uh, by non-Oracle specification leads. Unfortunately, Oracle has not commented publicly why it is they have down tools. Um, people don't know whether this is a business decision, whether it's a lack of resourcing, a lack of interest in Java EE. We simply just don't know. So a bunch of uh, community people, as well as vendors and customers and the standards body has been pushing Oracle quite hard to get answers, uh, but we still, unfortunately, don't have one. Two groups have sprung up very recently, and you've probably seen them in the news. Uh, James Gosling himself has been speaking on podcasts about some of these efforts. There's a Java EE Guardians and a, an EE Central, uh, I guess, platform that are being built by the community at the moment. Uh, to sort of celebrate Java EE, talk about what future direction it could go in, and hopefully try and break the deadlock that appears to be going on right now. So we have Java EE. It's kind of gone to a halt. Uh, people don't know what's going on. And uh, there are a lot of people who are asking, who've been asking us individually questions about this. And sort of here's your opportunity to ask, is it still important? Why is it important? What's going on? Uh, so on and so forth. So again, ask your questions to that hashtag, or please come on down to the front here, and you can ask a question. Any volunteers, be brave. Burning question you might have had. I'll see if there's anything on Twitter to start with. <gasps> Do -do -do. OK, the first question. Java EE is really slow, slow to develop. It only comes out every three or four years. Why does it even matter anymore? It's too slow for the modern development world, is, is the comment here. It's not even really a question, it's a statement. Java EE should just die. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Peter. I'll go first, but you could probably show them the end slides as to the reason why. Um, because we need, a, we need um, well, standards are, are good if you want a, to build, if you don't want to build the things that you, that you always need, like concurrency or transactions, remoting. Um, so it, it, in our mind, it's still relevant. And well, um, I think, you know, we need to share a common language. Uh, I'm not English, but because I'm working hard to uh, speak English, you can understand me. And because I've found this common ground with you and we can exchange, then we can have a talk, then we can have a beer, and then we can create the future. Java EE was never about innovation, never, and it won't be. It's just about building a, a, a basement, a starting block, where people can talk the same language. If we need to store an object into a database, which we mostly do, 
uh, well, we don't need to innovate in that space at this level. Let's create JPA, then we have JPA, and we can build on top of that and innovate. You know, the innovation comes um, on top of Java EE, but it's good to share a common lo uh, knowledge, uh, common language, so we can just forget about JPA and do something else. Um, I think one of the worst things that you could do within standards is standardize too early, too quickly. You end up with standards that people don't like. We've already heard EJB mentioned. CMP. Well, and that. Um, so to say we should standardize a lot quicker than we do, on the one hand, I, I get it. We should absolutely do that when it makes sense. And now that we've you know, dragged Sun and now Oracle into the whole open source ethos, we can use open source to drive the open standards, get communities behind them, and then once we're pretty sure we've got something that works, then we should standardize it. We should absolutely not rush headlong to standardize something that somebody's just thought of as a really good idea in their, you know, in their back garden one day over a few beers. Um, that would be the wrong thing. We would end up with more EJBs and CMPs. Lost your frog. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to agree with what both of you said, actually, what Antonio said. So we encourage the innovation to happen in the implementations, not in the standardization. And then to Mark's point, uh, speaking about not rushing to standardize, actually, we've been encouraging, as people come forward for new ideas for specifications and JSR, it's actually in the executive committee, we've been encouraging people to get that um, experience with the community, go start with an open source project, don't come in and standardize something until you have more experience in the community and the marketplace and then you can agree on what you're going to cooperate on in terms of in the standard and then compete on the implementation so that's so I, I would add um, you know there's a lot of FUD that typically comes up uh, fear uncertainty and doubt around standards and one of the ones out of here a lot is oh, I tried to port my application it wasn't perfectly seamless so therefore standards suck and uh, my kind of rebuttal to that is standards and portability is not a silver bullet. It's really a life raft. You have some chance if the ship is sinking into the ocean, you have some chance to save your work over the last several years and move it on to another implementation that's stronger, better, or faster. And it's not like this doesn't happen. People do port all the time. You will have work involved. Uh, it won't be immediate, like click a button, you're going to do it in a day. But it's possible, right? And so therefore, when you consider the amount of money that you spend over the course of several years of development, this is really boiling. If you're on a team of like 20 going for several years, that's a lot of spend. That's extremely high amount of money. The fact that you can port that to another implementation that you like better is a tremendous advantage to you. You should like standards. In fact, as a vendor, we like to lock you in, but you have portability. You should want standards. It's us who should want to lock you in with non-standard APIs. So the fact that we have to sell standards as a good thing to consumers is kind of, kind of funny. Um, those, they're in your best interest. So I really should urge everyone to think of standards as your rights, your protection, not something that you're held against or are slowed down by. Uh, you can build everything you want on top of standards. In fact, that they come out every three or four years is fine. It means the world doesn't change on you every day. You can actually rest a bit, try, create new things out. If you invent something awesome, put it back into the standards, and everybody else gets it. So there's only one thing so far that I strongly disagree with that anybody up here has said, and that is the notion that there is no innovation in Java EE. I would say there's... No innovation um, in uh, uh, the speed at which standards get created. There is a ton of innovation in the technologies that are built on top of it, though. We're, we're all sitting up here. We, we all build stuff on top of Java. -y. A lot of people in this room build stuff on top of Java -y and use Java. -y. There's a lot of innovation going on in here in Java. -y. Don't confuse. I think we shouldn't confuse that with you know, the speed at which EE specs are evolving at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question has come in. Uh, to what extent do you all see the shift to cloud undermining Java EE? Isn't Java EE kind of the old legacy server-side style of building applications? Where, do, where does Java EE even fit in the cloud? Yeah, so, so I'm, a, 
I'm an IBMer. We have a cloud. Um, I, we, we went through that same, we asked ourselves that question um, four or five years ago. Um, and you know, there, there is a perspective uh, from some people in the industry that, yeah, Java EE has been around for a while. It's this monolithic thing. Who on earth would be crazy enough to build a, you know, a modern cloud-based solution on Java EE? And it really depends on how you build that Java EE infrastructure. For us in IBM, it is a set of building blocks, and it's a set of building blocks that we can recombine any way we like to solve uh, any number of problems in Java. So our Java platform in IBM's cloud is all based on Java EE. So don't think that Java EE either is or isn't a good platform in which to build Java solutions on the cloud. Consider how the Java EE implementation on which you're building in the cloud is, you know, is it a composable architecture? Is it something that you can deploy Java-based microservices on that consume EE technologies, of course it is. Uh, I'll, so I'll start by, you know, seconding what Ian's just said in terms of, <clears throat> you know, Red Hat as a cloud, OpenShift as our platform as a service. We've had um, versions of EAP on OpenShift since uh, 2011. I think we were the first vendor to uh, to put Java EE as a supported uh, configuration on our platform as a service. And we do exactly the same thing as, as IBM. As just, we just heard about them. You, know, it, you, can, you can be developing your J enterprise Java applications without knowing you're deploying onto a Java EE app server. That, that's a, you know, an orthogonal aspect. However, I will also say, which may be more to the, the point of the original question, we see from, the, from 2011 still to today, we see a hell of a lot of people who are developing Java EE apps and deploying them to the cloud knowing from the get-go that they want an app server. They just want it to be in the cloud, public and, and hybrid. They, you know, they're, they're not bothered about uh, this abstraction hiding that they're deploying onto an app server. They really do want to deploy an app server and they don't find it anathema or a completely uh, old-fashioned way of developing. Um, Java EE7, so let's go back to two, uh, 2009. Java EE7 started in a very bad way. If you go back to the blogs, if you go back to the mailing list, which is public, uh, Oracle finished Acquired Sun, and the topic of Java EE7 was the cloud. So for months and months and months, the spec leads were pushing cloud into Java EE, while most of the expert group was saying no. So again, we come back to standards and, and innovation. Standards come after. And it was, unfortunately, we don't have anybody from Oracle, but it was a business move rather than a technical move. In 2009, you do not st uh, standardize an API uh, about cloud. You say, no, let's people innovate and then we will standardize. So that was the idea of Oracle back in 2009, to put cloud into Java EE, but we stopped them. I would add also that uh, uh, the platform has historically been about making no assumptions about the environment you're running in, such that you could move that app onto very disparaging different types of platforms, different types of file systems, different types of uh, runtimes. And so that is actually a really huge advantage when you want to pick that app up out of that one server and move it to a more cloud-enabled platform. Uh, it, it's basically been about inversion of control from the beginning. You're not supposed to call the container. You let the container call you. You react to things that are happening uh, to service requests. And, and there's a portable way to package a, an app application up that doesn't uh, you know, allow you to uh, be closely bound to the server. So. When those things are on pass uh, platforms as a service, now that app, instead of running on a local machine on your box, you could, boom, one day move that thing into any of the cloud providers that support uh, an e app server and not have to start from scratch. Uh, you got, aside from these fine folks, you have like Jelastic out there who's uh, got some ability to host EE apps, and you can move those day one and then you're suddenly running in the cloud. Um, you know, and that's just been an advantage of the fact that the platform has always been 
determined to make you not dependent upon the system that you're running in. For portability's sake, uh, we, just, we just got some huge benefits from that when cloud came up, and we didn't, even know, we didn't know that that was going to happen. It just did, and then we're like, wow, win. So I think in a lot of ways, it was, it was ahead of its time uh, in that regard. Yeah, so I would second what Antonio said, that yeah, there's a, there was a push to have a cloud platform, but it got pushed back, and, and that's really a great thing because you've got different ideas, and Antonio has been the main one who's been pushing this containerless architecture, embeddable architecture. And that is because Java EE, you've got this, I guess, pizza dough that is malleable, that everybody understands, supports, that people are able to innovate on the basis of those technologies. Otherwise, we wouldn't have things like Spring Batch or, or the other embedded containers like Pariah, Micro, you know, it's because we've got these sort of standards that has allowed us to push the platform forward where I guess technically we are missing things are things like security and manageability and as well as what you need for, I suppose, proper microservices such as distributed logging. I know we have the catching right now, but I've probably I'm getting down the technical side of it, so... So that's Could Java EE, a piece of dough, I think. <laughs> that's the quote we're going to take away from this, yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. Keep, keep the questions coming in, by the way. I've got a couple of uh, new interesting ones that have just come in now. So uh, here's a bit of a, a, a supporting argument for Oracle stopping this work, perhaps. Um, do people on the panel know, perhaps uh, some of the larger vendors who, who have run JSRs themselves, how expensive is it to run one of these? Isn't Oracle, in fact possibly saving tens of millions of dollars by not throwing all of its resources behind the Java EE 8 platform? Well, I mean, we we run and have run quite a few JSRs over the years, and I guarantee it doesn't cost us tens of millions of dollars. Um, I mean, maybe Oracle just like to pay a lot of people to do standards? I, I don't know. I can't comment on that. But I think the way we've done them is they've been a natural part of the work that we've been doing in our upstream community projects. Yeah, I mean, they do cost in terms of travel and meetings and a little bit of additional time. But like I said at the start, if you're not innovating upstream first and foremost and then standardizing, then you're doing it wrong in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's moderately expensive to lead a JSR. Um, most of us up here have probably led at least one. You know, you've got to nail the spec, produce the RI, the TCK. I mean, the, these things don't cost for, uh, you know, don't, don't come for nothing. But having said that, um, you know, I, I think there is an opportunity here for a greater distribution of the workload. And I think we are going to see that over the next 18 months. Yeah, I would uh, add, you know, as a point of reference, if you want to talk about in a, in a rather anemic way to create a, an organization to distribute cost, if you look at the Apache Software Foundation, they produce Hadoop and Cassandra and Tomcat and HTPD and hundreds of projects, and a lot of them basically run the entire world. And that's 4,000 volunteer committers and three full-time employees. So the, dis the costs are distributed amongst all the people who participate, and that is a very shining example of what can be done to change the control structure in such a way that things can be community-oriented and driven and still function, because obviously it's proven that a lot of the world runs on Apache software, and if it went away, we would all be pretty much hosed. Or what's the UK equivalent of that? Uh, yeah, hosed. Who hosed? Hosed, is that right? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, you know, there is a model that we can look at for reference. And if we were creating standards the same way we created, uh, you know, open source implementations, I think that that would be a very good thing for us. Um, and if we had all sorts of implementations for those standards, we would just really be winning on top of winning. Uh, that would be really the ideal utopia that I would hope that we could maybe strive towards is a very heavily distributed cost 
which means that if you know any one particular player chooses to leave, it's okay. It's survivable. Everyone should be allowed to come and go. Um, and that's just the way that, that uh, community and standards uh, work. Okay, so I'll follow on quickly from that, um, just before I go to a live question here. So the question has been asked by several people on Twitter. So quite pointedly, IBM, Tommy Tribe, Red Hat, everyone else on that panel, are your organizations actually going to commit to taking over the work for Java EE8? Is, is this now the intention? Well, so, so I, I probably the only one who doesn't have to raise a frog on this one. We're, we're 16 people, and we'll take on as much as we possibly can, but we would do it in an open source fashion where we would try to distribute the cost to our partners in the industry, which is all of you. And that would be the right way to do it, and if we had the opportunity to do so, we would step up to the plate. Um, I'm not going to raise a frog. <laughs> Um, absolutely, we, we would want to do that. Uh, I mean, obviously the devil's in the detail. There are a number of things I and Red Hat would like to see in terms of improvements in the way in which you know, the whole standards process works. And you know, David's touched on one or two of them. Whether we can get them, um, I don't know. No, I'm not going to articulate what they are at this stage because then I will have to raise a frog. Um, but yeah, I think... You know, Red Hat would definitely want to step up and, and take on some of the load if we can get the right kind of um, message from um, the current vendor in charge. Yes. And, and we have. Excellent. Okay, I will go to a live question here. Actually, I, got, was the, I had the same questions, basically. It means Oracle is decreasing in uh, working on this, apparently. But the thing is, what's next? The thing is, a lot of people, including myself, did invest a lot on E. Um, the question is, looking at the current situations, my qu I have doubts. I say, should I move to Sprint, Sprint Boot? Should I continue to advise customers to continue with EE? I would love to do that. The fact is what, is, what is going to happen if tomorrow, again, Oracle says, guys, no way anymore for us. We keep on Java IC only. Uh, who's going to take the lead? Well, it's I... Officially, it means you guys said, yeah, we are willing to. But I don't see any real beside the Java Guardians that says, yeah, we need to, we need to, we need to organize itself. But amongst all the other vendors, except right now, that's the first time that I hear something about from IBM, from Tony, B, uh, Tony Bright, and and and, and Red Hat, JBoss, to say, yeah, we are willing to, but are you guys already ready to organize yourself in order to move forward on this and to say, Oracle guys, if you want to set them, why not? Yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, <laughs> and, and let me expand on that, Mark. <laughs> oh, please do in. So. So those two um, communities uh, that, that, that are forming at the moment, the Guardians, and uh, the, the thing that was called eecommunity.io, um, it's, you know, it's been referred to um, internally for a while as javaee.io as well, but we got some advice on that, uh, name, choice of name. Um, but, <laughs> but there's... Um, so what, what I'm expecting... Um, folks to see in the very near future. A lot of the people up here and some of the people in the audience have been working on trying to, I've been working on you know, drafting, um, uh, if you like, the, the mission statement for those groups in order to um, enable them to be somewhere where we can collaborate. As an example, um, so uh, Red Hat and IBM have observed uh, over the last six months that we are both doing something quite similar with our approach to microservices. So the Red Hat guys, uh, I, uh, Mark will talk about this, he doesn't need me to, but you know, they, they have a technology called Wildfly Swarm. Um, IBM has a, uh, a technology for uh, uh, building microservices to, to deploy onto our infrastructure faster, which um, we couldn't come up with a very cool name for it, and we called ours the Liberty Application Accelerator. Um, <laughs> we've never been very good at coming up with names. Um, however, however, the, 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 the actual technical approaches that we were both taking were quite similar. So in the past, 
we might have got together over a beer and decided to spin up a JSR uh, and work together uh, with other people uh, on that under a JSR. This time round, um, we still got together over a beer, um, but we decided that we'd get together, figure out where we've got commonalities, common differences. Uh, we're getting close to spinning up um, a, a GitHub project, and we're going to do it under one of these communities as an exemplar of how we think that can work in the future. So we, we, our expectation is that the JCP is a great place to ultimately standardize something. Um, but we need, you know, we are going to you know, not start there uh, when we work together anymore. We're going to innovate in open source, probably under the umbrella of one of these communities, and then take stuff to the JCP. And with as many people involved as we possibly can get, good open source community efforts. I think, well, recently we did suggest when someone came forward with a configuration JSR proposal to the JCP, the executive committee actually did suggest that they go get some more experience in the open source community and start an Apache project, which they did. They started the Apache Tamaya project. Go get experience in the open source community and then come back and decide what you want to standardize on and get support for that. And I would also just want to say, what, one other thing with regards to the stats that we produce in the JCP. For the last couple of years, we've actually been reporting annually. I do stats on who's participating in JSRs and who's leading JSRs. And it's been a conversation in the executive committee for at least the past two years when I've brought these stats forward is that it's healthy for more people to step up and take a, more, a leadership role in the community. So it is something that we've been discussing for a few years. And I just finished with one other, I think it was the question from the audience, which is what is the next step? Well, so actually for the JSRs um, that have not produced a milestone in the last year, which most of them produced a milestone about six or seven months ago. So coming up in the next several months, uh, we introduced in response to some of the comments from the community, this concept of renewal ballots. So it will be mandatory for the JSRs to go through renewal ballots in the next five to six months, at that point, the executive committee would vote on them based on whatever um, public statement the Speckley would put forward. We would vote on those to see whether or not those JSRs would continue, because that's something that we've recently introduced as far as how the JCP process itself works. Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but if Ian and Mark go out for a beer, uh, commit some code, and in a few months or so, they go back to, to the JCP and they say, we have this fantastic idea, let's standardize microservices. And they knock on the Java EE door. It's the Java EE spec lead that will say yes or no. So if they find something fantastic and if they want to standardize but put it in Java EE, then it's the EE spec lead that has the right to say, Yes, your stuff is going in or no? Oh, am I wrong? It depends. Okay, she has a frog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it depends. It depends on if it's going to be a standalone JSR. I mean, Java EE is more than just the platform, right? It's the entire ecosystem. So I can't really speak to that. I don't really know anything about the project. So I can't comment on whether or not that's the actual target. I think it's actually a healthy thing to have more things standalone. So lately, the trend has been that. JSRs start because they think they need to be part of the platform, but I don't think it's a bad thing to have standalone JSRs. I think it's actually a healthy thing to see some JSRs being targeted for a platform release and some being standalone. So there's one thing that everybody's aware of that is going to fly down from the heavens, and that is this Project Jigsaw, which promises some great modularity. So potentially that could be a great place for component spaces where you can build your own app server as well as a Java runtime and compose everything yourself. Okay, I've got another question here from the audience. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. Stefan. Um, I did miss the first part, so I don't know if it was covered, but um, what you're clearly seeing is like players like Google and Amazon, they're providing uh, AWS lambdas, Google functions. So I'm just wondering, 
um, in five, ten years' time, we might just be just developing functions in the cloud, and I'm just expect. I mean, will Java EE then still be relevant? If well, that's the, the yeah, way it's those, going to move those, forward. So maybe you missed what Ian was saying, and then I seconded it. But those functions, if you want to do enterprise backends using transactions, data, large scale caching, high performance messaging, reliable high performance messaging, scalability, robustness, etc. Why would you not use Java EE as a really good platform? If you as a developer don't know that Java EE is under the covers, but it's there and it's giving you the robustness that we've come as an industry to, to, to basically get to over the last decade, it should be good for you because then you're not getting completely new bugs with a completely new framework or a completely new stack developed from scratch in, God help us, JavaScript. Uh, I would rather running on Java EE. I would just add that I see what we try to do when standards aren't a factor, logging. If we can't even get logging right, I don't know that we're going to get portable functions in the cloud right. Yeah. I just have, uh, <laughs> I have low expectations of it, personally. And, and uh, you know, uh, there's just a lot of real things that we need, like uh, standard async libraries and standard ways to do certain things. And they just, we're, it's in our best interest for them to be portable. Um, otherwise, you know, the servlet people go different ways. Jetty makes HTTP look like this when HTTP2 comes along. Tomcat does it like that when HTTP2 comes along. And then somebody wants to write a library on top of that, and they have to decide which HTTP version are they going, standard are they going to go with. And then someone's going to go, well, that's silly that you have to pick between the two of them. I'm going to write a, a layer on top of those two called the uh, SLF for HTTP, and uh, <laughs> then we're going to program to that, and someone's going to, no, 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 no. Mine is way better because actually I've designed it more, in a, you know, and it's like that old XKCD cartoon where there are 12 standards? I can't believe it. I'm going to make a new standard that ties them all together. <laughs> new status quo. There are 13 competing standards. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I just don't see us getting our ducks in a row to make that happen. I think we make a big mess and then Java becomes this disorganized world that is no different than a Ruby or a Python where you have kind of de facto libraries, but they're never so de facto, and everyone's trying to topple the other library over, and we just reinvent the same wheels down here over and over again. We never get to these wheels up here. Any and Node.js no developers out there? No. <laughs> my point. Yeah. So Lambda's cool, um, so is Node. Um, yeah. <laughs> so J Java's not the only game in town, um, it, it, but and, and in, a, in a cloud environment, it, it, it shouldn't, I don't think anybody would consider that Java is the answer to every single problem. It's not. Uh, there will be lots of different workloads. Uh, some of them will run on Java, some of them will run on Node, some of them will be Lambda functions. Um, it, it, there's, there's plenty of space for all of these things. I suppose it depends on the granularity. It, it, and everybody has this idea of microservices, but then when you look at it, you, you can use any other language, you could use Java, if you're going to use Java, what kind of distributed cache are you going to use? It, it just takes a long time. Um, the one thing that, yeah, Jcash is the one that's recently come out, and so that is based on Hazelcast. So there's lots of people that I know in the industry using Hazelcast for lots of uh, distributed tr um, in memory and, and notification, not necessarily transactions, but they're just using to say in uh, in banking to say uh, if I. If I report a trade in London, it instantly hits the, the server in New York and also in Singapore and vice versa. So uh, these sort of things, if something should happen to Hazelcast, you know, and you program directly to Jcash, well, uh, to Hazelcast rather, you, these are the sort of things that as they are being developed and being more used in the industry, you definitely think that they feel like they should be in a Java standard. 
Okay, so I will move on to... Oh, I was just going to say, ahead. so for, for example, Jcash is a great example. There's multiple compatible implementations. Not, Hazelcast is just one. It's actually one of the most implemented JSRs that we have in the JCP. So there's many choices there. That's what compatible implementations guarantee for developers is that choice and for customers. Cool. So we, we have about five minutes left. So I'll go on to the, the last question because that's hopefully relevant for people walking away from this with something practical to do. So there are these two new groups that are starting, uh, Java, Java EE Guardian, self-styled, uh, which is sort of uh, a group which has been, um, uh, it's a large community. I guess Reza Rahman is probably the, the most uh, vocal or, or, or most prominent member in there. Um, and there is a sort of EE Central or EE community forming as well. So. How do people join either of these communities, or and, and what are the differences between them? Um, hmm, good question. Uh, so I wrote the first draft of the mission statement for the Java EE.io stuff, and so I can kind of speak to that one more than the Guardians. Um, in terms of getting getting involved in it, I know there's a Slack channel. Uh, I'm not sure if you have to get invited to it. There, there will be a, a, a process, but it's all going to be open source. I mean, David also, David actually predates my joining, so he should probably talk to it. But I would just say, you know, it's all open source. It's all going to be community driven. Um, and, you know, if, if people are really interested in the future of Java EE, then, you know, you should get involved in that. And I'm not suggesting that you dump the JCP. Absolutely not. If you're a member of the JCP, stay there. If you're not, Join that as well, because the more communities that we have that can focus our combined efforts on the future of JRE, the better. I think it's fair to say that these things are just getting off the ground at the moment. So you know, in answer to the question, how do you join, how do you get involved, um, I think there's, a still, <laughs> there's still a certain amount of uh, getting the thing off the ground that will make it easier to join and get involved once it is off the ground. So uh, that's something I think will become, I hope, clearer in the next four or five weeks. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'll say, you know, I, I, I purchased the Java EEIO domain name last summer, or right, actually right after DevOps uh, this, you know, last year. And with the idea was that I heard a lot of people complaining that there wasn't anything like Spring.io for Java EE. How much does it cost? Uh, uh, 10 million pounds. <laughs> uh, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it was very expensive. Um, so, you know, the, the idea was there to, to basically try and tie everything together and make common infrastructure around the Java EE community in general. And hopefully that that could be some place uh, that's a little bit Apache-like and allow collaboration in, a, in, in community controlled, community created uh, community everything infrastructure so that the the source code of the site would be open source everybody could do get pull requests and we could actually participate in building not just the standards but the things that run the standards so the the infrastructure cost would of ee in general would be lower and there'd be many ways that you could participate in ee uh, so that was the idea of it uh, how far we can take it i guess is really up to us um, but the idea is to make the process of creating standards in something that we control. Uh, that's fully open source ground up. Yeah, so I would just say that what, between the EE Central and the Java EE Guardians, just join one. Um, um, e, the, the Guardians probably are, and this is my opinion, they are more assertive a little bit more political and maybe just a tad controversial. But these, these, they also have a website which they've just published. I know that the EE Central guys are working behind the scenes on theirs. And, and so I would just say get involved, get into it, and get the groove on. If you really love Java EE and it's helped your career as well as your bosses, then get involved with either one or both of these communities. Join every effort you can that how you think will help. I'll just say anything. that um, we are in the worst uh, position because um, either Oracle says loudly, stop, and those guys will take over, or Oracle will say loudly, I'm keeping on, 
and you know Java EE keeps on. At the moment, Oracle says nothing. So officially, things are okay. And when you work from inside, we know it's not okay. So join whatever is possible. Make any noise that you can on your blogs, on your tweets. But remember that until Oracle says yes or no, nothing will be stated, and that's the worst place. That doesn't stop innovation happening on top of Java EE, though. We're doing that. We all are. Cool. Okay. Well, um, time is pretty much up. So I'd like to uh, thank the audience for all of your questions. A whole bunch came in from Twitter. And I'd like to thank the panelists for spending their valuable time. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sure you can probably catch any of them for some uh, barroom NDA style details of, of what's been going on behind the scenes.